Now begins the third and final part of the conversation about living and building careers in China. This series is very heavily about how golf developed, changed in China and their parts in it. It's very insightful. If you missed the first two episodes, you can go back and watch them. Although, if you're picking this up now, you can totally get everything from this episode by not watching the others, although I wish you would. And I also wish you would like, comment, subscribe. This episode is divided up in the following way. The first couple minutes, first two minutes, are about how golf in China changed and developed since the late 90s, as I've just alluded to. Then caddies in China, who plays golf in China, the Chinese government's invention in intervention, invention, intervention in golf, golf as a status symbol in China, and what these two gentlemen got to do and maybe wanted to learn after being a part of the hyper growth that was the economic miracle of the early 2000s and then part of the 2010s in China. Thank you for sticking it out if you've watched all three videos. I mean, that's probably about 10 of you. I appreciate it. You will certainly enjoy this conversation, the final conversation in this series of China Talks. Can you talk about how golf changed between when you got there and now because of some pretty significant intervention? And then the state of golf in China now. Jeff, I think it's better if I handle this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's yeah, all you. you know, so when I got to China, I think there were eight golf courses, uh, two of which were at Mission Hills where I worked. Uh, today, Mission Hills alone has 22 golf courses, I believe. Uh, 12 in kind of Sinjin and Dongguan area. Uh, they're kind of separate. And then 10 and down in uh, – 10 down in Hainan Island, which is uh, kind of, the, they call it the Hawaii of China, which is a bit of a stretch, but that's what they call it. So, um, you know, a lot has changed and a lot hadn't changed. Interestingly enough, when I was in the golf business, you know, the whole thing was about employing people. I mean, you had people, you'd go out on the golf course and all the caddies, all the workers were picking weeds by hand. They were out there in the middle, you know, they'd, they'd be like in these groups of swarms of people. They'd go down to the fairway and they just they just be out there they had a little tool like a little like a little pick or something and they they pick it you know and want like the thumb and the finger and they put it in a little bag and off they go and that's how they picked weeds we didn't spray um really for weeds and, and such like that as labor has gotten more expensive you you do still actually strangely enough see that uh, you mostly see it kind of in the non-fairway areas but you do see a little bit of that um and so that kind of went away. Uh, but the caddies, you know, everybody, every golf course in China requires a caddy. And it's not like a caddy, you know, in the States where typically you've got, you know, somebody who even, who even knows golf. I mean, um, yes, they've been trained probably a month is about how we used to train them. You know, we'd get them out there. They didn't, I mean, they came from, literally, they came from the mountains. Typically they came from, from the hinterland where um, we'd often bring in kids that didn't go to high school they'd go to like a vocational type school and then the, the vocational school would bring them to the golf course and we would employ them and pay them through the vocational school and after like a year or two they would just either stay with us or they'd go home um so these are like 16 17 18 year olds um and you know you had to teach them everything uh and and you know now of course over all these years later i remember you know i could go to a place where i was a golf pro 20 years ago and there are some caddies that are still there um you know that's the career that they they had and, and they can earn they could earn a lot, really good money 20 years ago compared to the population because they got tips. The strange thing about tips though is 20, 25 years ago, the tip was 100 RMB for 18 holes. That's about $12. Mm -hmm. Today, the tip is still often 100 RMB, which is crazy. Uh, you know, it should be 400 if you compare it to the cost of, of everything that has kind of gone up in China. So that stayed the same. Everybody still has caddies. They're typically all girls. They're typically between the ages of 18 and 22 or 23. And they typically stick around for three or four years and they, they get married or they go home or they do whatever. Um, some, some are male. I don't prefer the male caddies because the male caddies actually prefer, they're very strange. It, it's like they all think they're going to be a golf pro. Um, so <laughs> they, they, uh, they tend to give you 
you know, you hit a bad shot and they tell you, oh, you need to rotate your hips more or something. It just drives me absolutely insane. I actually re almost refuse to have a male caddy. And if I have one, I'm not very happy. Because the female caddies, they're, they're just they're just there to take your bag. Have the cart, give you your club. I'll tell you, you hit a great shot when you really didn't. Point, oh. out, or point it out when Dave hits an OB. You know, they say, <laughs> OB <-la." laughs> <laughs> like, you, like you didn't see the ball fly yeah. 40 yards to the right out of bounds. <laughs> One thing I've it's come to light for me by working at a golf course once a week now is how golf is the most mansplained sport on the planet. I mean, every time I see a woman on the range at the golf course I go to, there's sure to be another guy that's going to not let her hit. It's going to let her hit like one ball every five minutes because he's got so much input. So that's not unique yeah. to any country. Yeah. <laughs> but but I mean I I just couldn't believe it. Even 15, 20 years ago, I, I just I just knew the day was coming where it wouldn't be feasible to employ caddies. I just thought, and and it wasn't even the cost of the caddy. Even when I was running the golf course, I had always done numbers, you know, on, even on paper, like hey, how do we get out of using caddies? Like why do why do we use caddies? Well, caddies make money um, for the club, and there's ways around that. You could always do different things. You can raise free fees or whatever. But what the, the, the player in China is really relying on the caddy too much now for the rules, for fixing ball marks, for, you know, driving the cart, for telling them where to hit it, uh, advice, you know, like, I mean, it's crazy. And, and so if you take a, a, a Chinese who hasn't traveled abroad, at least, you know, and, and experienced golf without caddies, you know, I, I used to, the Chinese buddies would joke and say, oh, the first time they go to America, they're playing golf, they leave the pin out. <laughs> they just take the pin out, they leave it off the side, they forgot to put it back in. They're just not used to it. They're leaving clubs behind. I leave clubs behind here sometimes. I just bring my wedge and leave I, it. I, I, just, I, just, I just turn around and hand my club to some imaginary person that's not there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There's like a balance or a tension between like, is this a, a sport that was well, obviously not a sport for the masses? Because in, in America, you can go play around at a municipal place for, I can play in my hometown, I play nine holes for $14, right? It's not a rich man sport in America. It can be, right? There's, there's definitely aspects of it, but you can go play any dog track in, you know, and it, 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 with golf now, you can play 18 holes with a cart for 40 bucks, right? At a decent little course. Whereas in China, it's, it's always expensive, right? And so it's a status symbol. And so you've got this um, where the government, which is, you know, supposed to be looking out for the, the common man or whatever, there's just kind of a, a tension where they're not always, it's not always in favor with the government, right? And so you'll have government officials, won't name any names, but that, that Jeff and I know that will, if they're going to go golfing, they'll go golf, you know, far out of town, right? So if they get seen, it's not by someone local. Or if like Jeff, you, you were played at, played at Palm Island and I don't remember the rationale for it, but at one point they just planted trees up the entire fairway of all these holes. So, so there was a fairway we used to, you know, aim for, right? And all of a sudden one day there's little, you know, saplings down the entire fairway and they decided to grow up and golf course gone, you know, and, and that was politics. It was, it didn't, it, it doesn't enjoy the total blessing of the, the CCP. Yeah, it, does, it, does, it doesn't at all. I mean, so from 10 golf courses in 1997 to, I think they got up to seven, seven fifty, uh, even though there was a moratorium on building golf courses, I believe from about 2003 or four, because the, the, it was a land use issue. And what was happening was, in the local places where golf course was built, pretty impoverished typically because you got to you have to have all that land. So you have a big developer coming and saying, "I'm going to build a golf course. I'm going to build, build all these villas around the golf course, which is how they make money." Um, and then they would employ, you know, 300 people, and it was a big deal. And so the government would kind of, you know, look the other way on land purchases, and maybe there were some things that were being done that weren't were not above board, and it and it got away from them. So then the government said, "No more." And, and they're using arable land. I mean, they're using good land, like land that's supposed to grow. Um, you know, vegetables on. So, so what happened then was that as, as that happened, the, the government started cracking down on, on the golf course construction. And they said, you know, you, you can't build anymore. Well, then people still built them a little bit. And then they said, well, this isn't working. So now we're going to close them down. So they started this big purge where they went out. Um, but, That's a land, landline. Oh, it's my mom's phone. Is that a rotary phone? <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like one. So then they um, they did this thing where they said, well, we obviously can't stop people from building this. We're going to close them down. So they issued a list. You know, they said, there's 150 golf courses. It was, it was a big list. They said, we're going to 
you have to provide all this information. You got to provide your environmental certificates. You got to invite, you got to do all these things and you got to do it within three months. Say half the golf courses were able to provide most of it, which kind of like pushed it down the road a little bit. Some were just couldn't provide any and they were closed. Well, what happened when they were closed was they came in and said, hey, you're closed. You know, they put a piece of tape over the door, but then they kept letting people play golf kind of on the side. Well, then, it, then the government said, well, wait, that obviously didn't work. So what we're going to do is we're going to just come in with bulldozers. We're going to tear up all the irrigation. So they would just go and they would just dig up pipes and pipes would just be everywhere. Well, you clearly can't play golf. There's no irrigation. So that, that kind of killed it. And then sometimes that didn't work or that, they didn't do it. So they started planting trees. And that's what, what, what Dave's referring to. You know, Palm Island had 27 holes. Beautiful golf course. Jack Nicklaus designed. Man, it was awesome. And nine holes of that was a quasi-illegal. It just, it was only approved for 18. It, yes, the land was approved for golf, but it was only approved for 18 holes. And they built 27. So the nine that, that were infringing, they came out and they planted one day. I was just walking the dog, you know, out on the golf course. And, they, and I see literally a sapling. And like Dave said, they were probably about, probably that high. Uh, and they planted them every, probably five feet. Five feet that way, five feet this way, five feet this way in rows on the green, on the tee, in the fairway. And I have pictures, it's crazy because I would walk the dog you know, over the, the years after that and I would just take these pictures. It was like, it was as if you're watching that movie with uh, Will uh, Smith, like, um, uh, uh, oh, hold on, somebody's, <laughs> somebody's coming in, just a second. You know, I was gonna say also just to, another thing that's different about China, and I don't think this has changed. I think it's probably always been this way, but um in china if you say like oh you played golf today it's it's a status symbol you're rich right you're you're you're, you're really wealthy because you're going to spend to play golf you're going to spend 300 bucks right and i would say the vast majority of chinese can't afford that right and if you're paying 300 bucks in america you're playing somewhere really special right um so in china it's also way more of a status symbol back to my other point like if i go play the wing park municipal golf course here in elgin or, or almost any course, right? I'd have to play Medina or, you know, Chicago. I had to play somewhere uh, kind of exclusive to, to raise anybody's eyebrow. If I, most of these courses, and they might be a nice course, but oh, cool. You know, you paid $60 or $50 or whatever um, for a week weekday, you know, rate right with a cart. And it's not a status symbol, you know, it, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a rich man's sport at all in America. You can spend a lot of money, but you can play a, a lot of just middle class people. We, we know what to play all the time. Yeah, it's like sailing almost in China, right? It's a, that right. socioeconomic demographic that plays golf that goes sailing in America. Yeah, it, it, that's a big change in China. You know, it's a shame. I feel like there were a, a few small efforts to develop public golf. Um, there was a public golf course actually where Dave and I used to play all the time uh, in, in Long Island, right between his factory and our factory. It, you know, it's pretty decent holes. I think, Jason, you may have actually played it with us. Um, the public course in Long Gong. And it was probably only one of three public courses in the whole country. It was truly public. Now, you could buy a membership, but it was kind of like buying a membership at, you know, like an annual fee membership at a public course in America. Um, you know, the facilities were pretty pretty weak. The upkeep was pretty weak. But, you know, it was a golf course. I didn't, you know. It was a lot more affor- it was a lot more affordable than playing at like Mission Hills where you had to pay a big membership and then the greens fees were just, you know. Yeah, really cost prohibitive. Even, for... even the public course, right? I don't know, Dave. Do you remember what it was? It was like even you had to have a cart, you had to have a caddy. It's probably three hundred RMB for the yeah. for the green speed or two eighty or something like that. So you're spending forty, fifty bucks for the green speed for eighteen holes, and then you have to pay a caddy. And... But but that's not that's not obscene, right? That's not well. But 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 yet yet I guess my point of that was that I had this this idea that if I was the government and if I had the golf course, I would do something where maybe. Yes, I'd sell some. I don't know what I do on the high end side, but on the low end side, if you're a, a, a resident of the city of Sinjin or whatever, and you are under the age of 18, you can play golf for five dollars, mm-hmm. right? Because uh, yeah. because the reality is the money they don't need the money, and if you're going to develop the sport, and you and you own the facility, right? Then you could yes, you could offset. You could say there's a uh, 50 rounds a day available for city residents at. At literally carry your own golf bag or have a four caddy maybe and, 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 and my, my thought always was you have a four caddy until you pass a test you have to pass like a test about rules and etiquette and 
make sure you know how to put the flag in and replace your divot and fix the ball mark and, and keep up with the group. And you know, just very simple, right? Just a test. It could be easily administered, it can be taught, administered. And once you pass that, you can just pay 10 RMB. I know 15 RMB, that's like two, three dollars. Because that's the only way that you get the the true masses that can play, because they still have cost. They got to get there, they got to have golf clubs, you know. So ultimately, and then you could have the rest of the day the um, you know, normal 50 or 60 or $70 you know, breezy. But they've never done that. Even at the cheapest, you're talking about one tenth of a monthly salary to play one round of golf, mm -hmm. kind of on average. Yeah. Something like that, which is way too expensive. Yeah. It would be a good way to get kids off video games as the government is trying to do there, right? Give them another option. It would. Um, they're just I don't see that hap happening in the near term by any means. Yeah, they're, they're, they're just not going to do it. Um, they, they struggle with it. It's still considered. I, I think it's actually common for a lot of countries to, for golf to be very highbrow, very like an expensive sport. Like Japan, I know it is. I, I never played never played in Germany. I, I, it just seems like America, thankfully, you know, like in Scotland, I know that it's very affordable. People in Scotland, Ireland play all the time and it's not, it's, it's a national, national pastime, you know? So, but I don't see it changing for China and it has this stigma and China because of their communist history is a little bit more class oriented in which class you're in and there's divisions between them. And I think that that kind of is a sensitive topic. So. All right. As a grand finale question, both of your careers sort of mirror the hyper exponential industrial growth of China. You kind of progressed as did the Chinese economy. What do you think you got to do because of that? And what do you feel like you'd still want to learn that maybe you would have learned otherwise on a, a smoother, not as steep trajectory. Um, well, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Well, Dave and I talk about this a lot because um, so so if you think about our our trajectory with China, which is it's one hundred percent true, it's basically the same. You know, we were there at the same age, we'll call it, of Sinjin as a young twenty plus year old, right? And then we grew to our mid forties and a m more mature you know, uh, economy, more mature environment. But yet we looked at other people who were the same as us, and we'll call them local Chinese because really very few foreigners, I don't know any foreigners that really did what the Chinese did. And, and it was like they were on a rocket ship, like to Mars, and we were just going to the moon. Like, I mean, they were, they were going fast, furious, very successful. So sometimes I think, wow, man, like, what did we, what did we miss? Like, why? Why, even though, even though in my peer group and, you know, people that I know and, and in China, my peer group, I, we are looked at as very successful and I feel very successful. I have no regrets at all, but sometimes I think, man, gosh, what, you know, what would I have done different? Like, and I, I honestly can say I wouldn't do anything different. Uh, th there's reasons some of these people made faster progress, just things that we couldn't do. You know that Dave and I couldn't do, uh, especially at that time. Maybe given our age or our position, um, so that's kind of my 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 take on it. You know, what did I do differently? Maybe like so, I graduated from college and I didn't have any real world world experience, and I got put to China. And within like six months, I was in charge of three hundred people. You know, running a fifteen million dollar a year manufacturing operation, and. I didn't even know how to run a meeting at that point. I didn't know how to do any of the stuff that, you know, now is just like, uh, you know, so you, you build that skill set. And what I would say was awesome for me because I had the ambition to do it all. You know, I just didn't have, I didn't, hadn't learned how yet. And so me being willing to go to China and, and what they needed was somebody they could trust and that wasn't a total idiot, you know? So it's like, well, yeah, you're not yet ready to run a factory, but we at least trust you and you'll listen to us, right? You're not going to be, uh, you know, obstinate and, you know, arrogant or whatever. So it got me into a position where I, I would have never had that in America. Let's just say I'm competing against all these other capable people to go run that factory of 300 people or whatever it was. They would pick people that already had that experience. I would be put into a channel where over time I would gradually get the experience and just, you know, step by step, maybe by the time I'm 50, you know, I'm in that position. I got it when I was 27 and I made tons of mistakes, but 
you know, they weren't catastrophic mistakes. They were just, you know, errors as I was learning and I was able to, you know, that was really, really attractive for me um, because I wanted that. I wanted responsibility. I wanted the challenge. I wanted to be, um, yeah, I just wanted to, 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 to move up. And so I got that. Back to Jeff's point too. I remember like when this would have been 2000 and I don't know, eight, maybe 2007. I, I had the, like the one loan car at my company. Um, I bought a, yeah, it was 2007. I think I bought a, a cherry, which is a Chinese, uh, um, vehicle. And it looks, it's a cherry with one R. So it looks like Chevy. It's kind of like, uh, you know, it's not the most creative, uh, attempt at looking like a Chevy, but I bought that and I was the one car in the, the whole parking lot because we had several factories, probably a thousand workers total um, or close to it. And I had the one car and I was like the big man on campus because I had the car and it was a, I want to say it was 8,000 uh, or 88,000 or 888 RMB because eight's a lucky number. So I was at 12, 12 grand at that point. Right. Wow. And um, by the time I left that company about five years later, um, not only did everybody else have cars, they were way nicer cars, but then also, you know, just me, like my trajectory financially went up at a, at a rate that I was very happy with. But yes, I saw people all around, around me that were just like, some of them Chinese, some of them, you know, foreigners that did dramatically better. And, and it's, it's naturally to compare up. It's not natural you know, for somebody to say, well, I'm doing better than so-and-so. A lot of times you look at the person that did better than you and wonder like, how'd they do that? Why didn't I? But I just think um, what China gave me that I didn't, wouldn't have got else otherwise, it was just getting plugged in to a, uh, an entire society and economy that was going upward at a much faster rate than America, um, which America maybe had that back in the gold rush, back in when people were coming over from Europe. It probably was, right? Um, and then it matured. We got into it at a point when it was just, you know, uh, going lickety split. And we were able to plug in in areas where they were willing to give us a chance and trust us because they needed bodies. They needed somebody they can trust. And so that was, that was really, really awesome. One more topic on that. I mean, we, um, we, we, hit, we were there at the perfect time. Um, could we have done better? Yeah, of course. Uh, would we have had to have cut some corners to do better? Uh, we would have. Uh, so I'm happy that, you know, the way that, the way that my career in China took um, the friends I have today, Honestly, they're they're all China based, meaning that you know David, you right, um, our other friends, right? We all know. Mm-hmm. So these are friends that, you know, maybe yes, if I'd have stayed in Alabama, I would have had my friends in Alabama. So it's kind of natural your friends are where you are. But we just had a, a lot in common. We were in a foreign country, you know. We got to we got to vent about the the the, the things that happened, right? Which you just it, you, only if you've been there, you can really understand some of those challenges and the venting right um i couldn't vent with my friends back home about it because they would look at me like what are you talking about yeah. um, i don't even know what you're talking about right you must be, you must be making it up right but you gotta have it and so you had so much in common and you were all kind of doing something doing business you were you had stepped way out of your comfort zone to be in china whoever you met was definitely out of their comfort zone so so whether they were good people or bad people or in between they had something that you had which was stepping out of their comfort zone taking risk living in a foreign land, living in a foreign culture and a foreign language, um, and, you know, trying to make it. And that, that's the most exciting part about being in China or honestly, probably just being anywhere. It's been an incredible run. I'm sure I'll be back in China once COVID uh, settles down and I'll try to have a little bit more run in me to where it takes me. Yeah. I give you guys tons of credit. One thing I thought of was that you didn't really get in your own way. You may not have gone to the top of the mountain so to speak as some of the other people you mentioned but it doesn't sound like there are many times where y'all were like you know i don't think i can run a 300 person meeting because i didn't do it in america whereas there are some of us that like to overthink things and be like well i don't know how to do that so i'm gonna you know pass or whatever y'all didn't do that so i give you a lot of credit there yeah I, no, jeff, I, jeff, jeff and i jeff and i jumped in the water at the deep end to learn how to swim as we went like all the time yeah, yeah and i and i think that that's um you just sort of had to. I mean, you just had to. Like, there wasn't a lot of choice, right? You know, it was like Dave was running that 300 person factory. I was running a 300 person golf course at, yeah. I don't know, 25, 26. I had no clue what I was doing. Not a clue. Yeah. Um, I thought I did. Walk around like I did, you know, like the golf pro, you know, I had my 
had everything put together. It looked like I knew what I was doing. I didn't have a clue. Um, but hey, you know, set, set the table for, for everything else. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you for your time. You've got a call coming up. Yep. Right. I will talk to you soon. Can't thank you enough. I will work right. out so it can be informative and insightful. See you All later. Right.